Yeah, had a breakup and then we got back together in Verona. I have a very deep, deep relationship with that, that city. It's very bizarre. Welcome to Watch Mojo's Pop in the Culture, your weekly entertainment check-in. You know me, I'm your host with the most, Mojo. That's right, it's me, Mr. Hollywood himself, Matt Demers. Do I even need to say it? We got a great show coming your way. I'm going to be speaking with uh, the director and one of the stars of the hilarious film, Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul. Don't want to miss those chats. Plus, I've got the stars of Netflix's rom-com, Love in the Villa. It's all coming your way. But first, as we do, here's your Hollywood headlines. All right, and here to help me break down all the news is Watch Mojo's very own Ricky Tucci. Hey, Ricky, how's it going? It's going great. Thanks for having me again, Matt. All right, Ricky, we're starting with Ezra Miller. The actor recently met with Warner Brothers Discovery to discuss the future of the Flash film. This amidst their ever growing list of controversies. Are you in? Ezra stated that he's begun ongoing treatment for his mental health issues while his agent noted that the meeting with Warner executives was very positive. So, Ricky, what does this all mean? Crisis averted? Uh, I mean, it's a big crisis. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that's what it means. It's definitely a step in the right direction for Miller. But in terms of the confidence, you know, going forward and the accusations are, are very, very bad. So it's not just like a slap on the wrist type thing. Uh, I don't know if there's really any coming back from um, from something like this. Um, there's going to be a lot of work to be done. They don't want to scrap that Flash movie. Uh, no, I don't think crisis averted. I think maybe they put some uh, they put some water on a massive forest fire and uh We'll see where it goes from here. All right, we go from one troubled actor to another, and that's because Shia LaBeouf is back in the headlines, this time defending himself against claims made by Olivia Wilde. You can't be serious. You cannot be serious. The ball is on the line. LaBeouf has come forward to say that he was, in fact, not fired from Olivia Wilde's Don't Worry Darling film for combative energy, but, in fact, he quit due to a lack of rehearsal time. It's all about control. And after sending text messages to prove his point to Variety magazine, uh, it's kind of hard not to believe Shia LaBeouf here. Shia LaBeouf is obviously a very dedicated actor. He also has his own share of problems. Um, but, I, you know, I could see I could see uh, that I don't think he would be lying about something like this. Um, I, I do see that Olivia Wilde might, you know, put something out there to get some attention, to get some headlines. Uh, but that this production was already already like mired in controversy. So... You know, I, I, I'll, I'll lean towards Shia and say that he didn't get enough time to prepare. Do it! Just do it! Don't let your dreams be dreams. And moving on with good news for House of the Dragon fans. Following its smash hit debut and even bigger viewership for its second episode, HBO wasted no time issuing a second season renewal. Our houses are bound by a common cause. But not every show is so lucky. Many fan favorites are getting the axe, including Netflix's Resident Evil. This after only one season. The streamer also noted that the Umbrella Academy would be receiving a fourth and final season. This is the Sparrow Academy. Meanwhile, Riverdale will be finally put to rest after seven seasons. Let the fire within me blaze in glory. All right, Ricky, what show are you mourning the most? And by the way, if you say Riverdale, I'm afraid I can't have you back on the show. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't think anybody's going to mourn Riverdale. It died a while back. But, um, you know, obviously Stranger Things ending its its five uh, five seasons is going to be a, 
going to be sad to grow up with that. Um, Servant as well. I really, really enjoyed Servant. Um, and I'd like to see more of that for sure. But it's going to end with the fourth season. So, uh, you know, just taking it as it goes. This is my home. This is my family. And I will not let you take me away from them. <laughs> Speaking of TV series, well, Amazon Prime Video has quite the gamble on its hands when it comes to Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power. One thing we can do, better than any creature in all Middle Earth, we stay true to each other with our hearts. With a budget of $465 million US and five seasons planned, the Rings of Power stands as the most expensive TV show ever. And with a cast of mostly unknowns and a franchise that's been out of the spotlight for many years, is it really such a sure thing? For Frodo. All right, Ricky, what says you? Will this uh, gamble pay off or is Jeff Bezos' pockets just so deep? This doesn't really matter. So this is their Game of Thrones you know, moment. They have Wheel of Time as well, but but it doesn't carry the same weight. Um, this statistics place thousands of years before the original you know, trilogy and even The Hobbit, uh, from what I understand. It's a new uh, cast of characters, new, new cast of actors. So I think it's great. Um, I think it's gonna hopefully bring a whole new generation into this. Um, instead of sitting in front of a three hour movie, you know, we can break it, break it into, into different parts and, and watch it over time. And I think it's gonna work really, really well as a series. So I'm personally super excited, you know, keep throwing money at it. I wanna see more high quality, high fantasy stuff coming out from all of the streaming services. And last for us is a casting rumor coming out of the MCU. We thought it best to break it to you slowly. Break what? Comic book fans went into overdrive when they saw you actor Penn Badgley trending on Twitter. This was thanks to many outlets noting that he was seriously being eyed for the role of Mr. Fantastic in Marvel's highly anticipated Fantastic Four film. I just want to be good enough for you. I did everything I could for you. For Ricky fans seem to kind of dig this idea, but uh, what about John Krasinski? The fans wanted it. They gave us a little taste. And now it's time for somebody else to, to take the role. And honestly, Penn Badgley from, you know, if, if you had asked me about him before you, I would have said, what? Like from Gossip Girl? But we've really seen that this guy can, this guy can put a character. He can, he can play a deep character. He's got the range. And so I am all in, man. I would love to see him as Reed Richards. He's got the look, you know, with, he's got the beard and he can get the glasses on, you know, whatever it is. Um, yeah, man, it's, it's going to be interesting to see. And I think he's, uh, I think he's a, a great talent. So uh, always happy to see new faces. Um, that's a good direction for sure. Ricky, uh, to use the pun, this has all been fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for helping me break it all down today. All right, Ricky, here's where we get to have a little bit of fun uh, and go beyond the list with a, uh, a video from the Watch Mojo archives. What does that mean? Well, we get to riff a little. We get to give our own opinions. Do we agree? Do we disagree? I know you're a big Marvel fan. Yes. Uh, today's, today's video is Marvel. I'm trying to think, what is the next big Marvel movie? Is it Black Panther? What, what Wakanda, yeah, Wakanda's coming up, and that's probably going to be, that's a big one, man. It's the war with Atlantis. Yep, that's probably the next big, big blockbuster uh, one that I can think of. But not for a while, not for a while. But we do have the, we do have the series on um, on Disney Plus, uh, She-Hulk, going right. strong over there. You watching some She-Hulk? It's fun. Uh, I'm going to, I think I'm going to wait until there's like four or five episodes out, maybe, and then I'll, I'll kind of just like binge them in a row, you know? You're a binger, get I get it. I yeah. get it. All right, let's uh, let's get to this list. I tease that it is to do with Marvel. Well, these are Marvel Cinematic Universe moments from the MCU that left us all a speechless. These are I'm expecting some big moments, and throughout the years of Marvel, they've delivered some big ones. So let's see if any uh, that we're thinking of made the list, and maybe some that didn't. We'll call out Watch Mojo, but I think number ten is pretty good. Number ten is pretty good. It's uh, the Spider-Man Homecoming reveal where we revealed yeah. Liz's dad was, well, it was the Tombs. Vulture. Yeah, yeah, it was Tombs. It was the Vulture. That was a cool scene. 
That was great. I love the tension, uh, you know, between both of them, between Keaton and Holland yeah. the whole time. It's kind of, it's got, it's got this, like, I'm not going to kill you right now because you're dating my daughter, but I could. <laughs> uh, it's just a funny interaction to, to see and obviously very heartbreaking, uh, makes for great dramatic effect toward the, the end of that film. But yeah, that, that was, that was a good surprise. It, it was less shocking and just more like, ah, I, I like that. That's clever. That's good. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think it was it was the the tension that was built up. It was it was just the looks from uh, from those yeah. actors that they give. Yeah, so so fun, so fun. And Michael Keaton, is he coming back as the Vulture? Because at the end of Morbius, there was that really <laughs> there was that weird kind of head scratching moment, right? Yeah, is that going yeah, the anywhere? Sony Probably Sony wants to make their own the universe on the side. They have the they still <sighs> own the rights, you know, to to, to to some of these Marvel things. So uh, yeah, I think it's going somewhere for sure. Where I don't know. It's Morbin time, you know. We'll see. We'll see. Morbin time. Uh, Sinister Six. They've been trying. They've been trying so hard to get that Sinister Six going. So maybe, right. maybe. Yeah. All right. Number nine is the. Uh, oh, it's the that that quick cameo. Wandavision. Uh, remember yeah. when? Yeah, that was her. What was it? Her it was her brother shows up in the in the quick. Yeah. Alternate dimension. Yeah, Evan Peters' version, which is from the X Men Quicksilver. Oh, that's it. crisscrossed yes. with with Pietro. So, but with the original hair and everything, that was great. That's just a great nod to the comics. Um, obviously, kind of a nod to the multiverse in and of itself, uh, being these different, you know, having different Quicksilvers and kind of what the fans were talking about. So that was actually really cool. I didn't expect that at all. Caught me completely by surprise. Because in the movies, in the in the uh, in the Avengers film, when we met the first Quicksilver, right? Not in the X Men universe, which was weird because they were both came out at the same time it was uh it was a different actor it was a whole thing i forget yeah, the guy's it, name he was the kid from uh, kick-ass right it was the kick same ass, actor. right yeah oh that what's, guy. His name? what's his name yeah he's great too he's he's uh, he's in bullet train as well um uh, uh aaron Ta aaron taylor johnson aaron taylor johnson there you go right right yeah you're a great guy great actor you win nothing but thank you for <laughs> pulling it out of the hat no uh yeah no, that was a cool moment that was a cool moment and i, I remember everyone was like because that happened at the end of the episode so we didn't right. really know all the details and everyone was like on the internet going, wait, 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 wait what's going on? Yeah. Fun stuff. Fun stuff. Uh, WandaVision was one of, probably my favorite of the Disney Plus oh, shows. So good. What a, my, I love the direction they took that, you know, just going through the different areas as well. Yeah. Uh, it was very, very fresh, very refreshing. Loved it. Loved it. Are we getting a second one? I think, because we are getting a second Loki. I know that's very much in production. Well, Loki's we don't know like what happened with, with the white vision yet. So there are some things in the air. Obviously, Wanda is kind of an, uh, uh, she's uh, enemy number one at this point. Uh, very dangerous. So uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what goes on with that. Maybe She-Hulk represents her. I've heard a couple of things about that, which which is, would be pretty cool. Mm. But uh, we'll see. Uh, yeah, I would love to see it. I, she deserves definitely a second series uh, to flesh out her story. Yeah, that was a fun. That was a fun show for sure. Okay, number eight. <clears throat> this is a little interesting. This is uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two, all the way back in uh, well, not that far back, twenty seventeen. For some reason, it felt yeah. a lot a lot further back. But uh, this is where we met uh, Peter Quill's dad, Ego. Remember Planet yeah. Ego? And we also learned yes. that uh, well, he's actually cancer, and oh, he gave Peter's mom cancer, and yeah. Was the one you that can't killed trust her. these guys that was uh that was that was that was a pretty unexpected uh little twist there uh heartfelt i felt that one in theaters i yeah, don't know that was sad. that was sad you know he's looking for his dad this whole time thinking it'll fix everything and then it's like oh you're the reason i'm so miserable you're the reason uh but you can't trust these gods you can't trust these celestials i mean they're, they, they don't care about anything except for power at that point um so i mean it, it was it was pretty sad um Definitely a, 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 a like a shocking moment for, for Peter Quill to find that out and have to kill his own dad. Um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, that was, that was. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is obviously coming out too. I'm excited for that one. I think they're saying that's going to be the final one. Yes. With yeah, this particular cast. Uh, I'm sure they might keep it going with some others. So uh, that's always a fun time. I love those guys. Those characters are so just great. All of them. Number seven here. This is, Okay. I want your hot take because I'll give you mine. It's the Mandalorian yeah. reveal. This is going back to Iron Man 3. So Wait, the Mandarin reveal. The Mandarin. What did I say? <laughs> the Mandalorian. Mandalorian. <laughs> no, that's a whole other. <laughs> a whole other Don't tweet me. Don't at me. <laughs> Slip of the tongue. The Mandarin reveal. Thank you, Ricky. Um, so this is from Iron Man 3. And if you know the comics, you know that the yeah. Mandarin is the big bad. Uh, yeah. Especially when it comes to yeah. Iron Man and then he's revealed to be this joke character. They they played it off as comedy. So at yeah. the time, 
I hated it. I really did. Ben yeah. Kingsley. Uh, yeah, I mean, he was fine playing off the, the humor of it. And now that I think back, because it's been a few years, I think back, I'm like, okay, maybe it wasn't so, so bad because Marvel is, they like to have the, that kind of lighter touch. And, and I think they're going somewhere with the theme of like, you know, maybe it's not a real person, but uh, it's... I don't know. It was a, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of with you. Like at first, I did think it was a bit weird. Like, why did they, why did they take it in such like a, a joking direction? You know, he's an actor, and they kind of just played it up. Um, but to be honest, I don't really think about Iron Man three very often, so it's not one of the Marvel movies that I remember uh, relatively right. fondly. So I'm like, eh, it was kind of, it's like Thor: The Dark World. You know, it's like it's there, it happened. You know, move on. <laughs> You're right. Not shocking. I not shocking for me personally. I don't I'm not wouldn't put it on the list myself. No, and I think it wasn't a terrible movie, Iron Man Three. I just think it's you're right, it's kind of forgotten amongst kind of forgotten. Very the other me. stuff. The big stuff. Yeah. All right. Speaking of big stuff, we're getting we're getting into some heavy hitters here. Some big moments in the MCU. Uh this one coming from Avengers Infinity War. No, not that one. It's uh first Thanos' sacrifice. Yeah. Where he sacrifices his favorite daughter. Sure, yeah. that's your favorite daughter. You're gonna sacrifice <laughs> Gamora. Um, yeah, that was. This got me. This got me. I felt it. I yeah. felt it. Yeah, you know, up to this point, like we all we had always known that Thanos wasn't some quote unquote monster. He just he did what he thought would save the universe from you know what happened to his planet um, and what what happened to him. So when this happened, you're like, oh, he loves his daughter, but he also is willing to kill her to 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 you know fulfill his warped vision which is to kill half the universe um which you know why don't you just double all the resources why do you have to destroy half of everything you, know, you just make it if you can do anything just make it twice as much so everybody has as much but uh yeah obviously very sad you know seeing Gamora die I mean it's up till that point she's such a huge character and to just have him you know even though he threw her away and he cries it's still pretty brutal it's still pretty uh still pretty bad that he's willing to do that to his his favorite daughter you know let's not talk about Nebula <laughs> so what he would have done to her but yeah <laughs> Is this more is this more shocking than say the the Black Widow sacrifice uh, that she made? I don't I don't think so. Uh, just because you know it's Thanos. Like obviously he's gonna do whatever it takes. Um, and we knew he he favored Gamora. He you know it, Nebula would say it all the time. So uh, yeah, it was pretty shocking. But at the same time, I mean he's he's gonna he's gonna have to exact his plan to save the universe in his eyes. So there is no price that is too big to pay, even his own daughter. Absolutely. Absolutely. Number five, we're at the midway point. And this is interesting. This is coming from the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. We were less mm. speechless when uh, we saw the the attack with the and then the reveal of the bloody shield um, yeah. from our from our new cap. And that was pretty shocking because that that shield you know symbolizes so much. And then to see it covered in blood and used in such a such a manner was uh, I think that was the biggest shocking <sighs> moment. I love that. I think it's also just like a metaphor for America in general. You know, this you know this kind of like upholding justice, but you don't really see the way it's done. And sometimes it does get very bloody. And uh, yeah, not everybody's going to be Steve Rogers. Not everybody's going to be this selfless, literally selfless hero who would throw themselves in a grenade, even though they, they, there's no chance of survival. Like, um, and this he's a great character. Um, the, he's a, this this Captain America is really flawed. He's really human. And uh, I thought it was a great moment. It, it, it was shocking, but it was it was amazing, honestly, just to see see him that that bloodlust, that rage to consume him. Yeah. Because these people are super powerful, and these people are human beings, and it happens in the heat of battle, in the heat of the moment. Maybe not to maybe not to Steve Rogers, but you know, to anybody else wearing that suit, who knows, uh, or donning that shield, who knows. So yeah, it was it was a very good moment. I I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, number four. We we touched on this a little earlier. When we were talking about uh, Mr. Fantastic. Yeah. And, uh, well, he popped up in uh, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness along with the rest of the Illuminati. And then we they all got destroyed. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I remember that moment being like, what? I, in theaters. That was, that was, it was cool. It was cool to see that because it, it was unexpected and you thought, you know, uh, they'd be in there longer and... And nope. You can tell that's a Sam Raimi thing because that was so unlike Marvel. Yeah. Just kill them all in the most brutal way, and you know Wanda's like what mouth, and then like yeah, like it was it was so good. It was super unexpected. I didn't expect him to go full like you know murder murder all the Illuminati, but yeah, it, yeah, that that definitely surprised me. And obviously, you know, seeing Reed Richards as uh, John Krasinski and you know Professor X, Patrick Stewart, so just a whole bunch of curveballs being thrown in that uh, 
in that entire scene. Yeah, absolutely. Do you did you like the Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness where they went a little more at the horror side of things? Yeah, you know yeah, what I did. I, I think it I think it was good, and it is a, it is terrifying. The multiverse is terrifying. I mean, there's creatures. There's it, it, Wanda is terrifying. Her powers, like it, it's a you know, I like that they leaned into it. I like that they they chose Sam Raimi. You know, some of the critics won't like it as much, but it's it's always good to have a fresh take on the Marvel on the Marvel movies because there's just so many, and they can get very easily uh, fit into the same box. You know, if you uh, keep using the same formula. Definitely is. Uh, number three is Peter. Peter who? That would happen at the end of Spider-Man No Way Home when, well, they don't they don't remember Peter. MJ no. doesn't know who he is. What? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. This is going to be, uh, I mean, this is heartbreaking for everything he went through. You know, losing uh, May, uh, meeting, his, uh, meeting his alternate spider selves, and then losing them too. I mean, yeah, it, it's... I, I wouldn't say it left me speechless. It left me just very sad for Peter. It yeah. left me very sad for Peter. And um, I'm really curious to see how he's going to build build all of this back up. Is it going to be, you know, fixed by just magic? Is it going to be another spell? Or is it really going to be like, is it going to be this thing where they, they start to slowly remember? So, you know, it's a, it was a good way to end it for sure. Um, kind of making him, you know, help forcing him to grow up even faster. Um, and, 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 and consider even more things as we get toward this maybe older, more experienced Spider-Man down the line. Uh, we'll see in Secret Wars and, and so on. So, uh, uh, yeah, definitely a, a good choice, I think, on their end. Maybe these moments leave us speechless because we're trying not to cry. We're just, uh, we can't say anything because yeah. we're, we're fighting back <laughs> yeah. tears. Yeah. Number two is uh, Captain America Brings the Thunder. Oh, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Captain America mm -hmm. wields the mighty hammer. Yeah. That was a moment you watch those uh, people recorded like the like the audience reactions reaction. in the cinema. Yes. That's fun. That's always fun to see because that exact reaction happened uh, in my cinema the first time I saw yes, it. Yes, me, me too. Uh, I it watched was, it op opening night. And right, like you, such a great you, movie you, moment. You can't beat that. You can't beat being at a Marvel movie on opening night, Some, especially something like Endgame, where it's the culmination of you know years and years and years. So definitely a, a, a defining moment in cinema in, in general i think in cinema it was a one, one of the great battle scenes but uh definitely in the marvel universe uh top tier top tier moment didn't they tease that in like was it age of ultron where they were they were after the party trying to lift the hammer and <laughs> and uh, rogers yeah, oh, yeah, and it kind of it moved like the tiniest bit and, and you see like thor's like oh oh, oh no <laughs> yeah i love yeah, i love that stuff. they called back to that all right so that was number two i think I think we all kind of have an indication of what number one is, but we'll see. Uh, there are some honorable mentions, of course. I like when Watch Mojo does this. They throw out some stuff that maybe didn't make the top ten. Let's see if it should have. Uh, let's see some honorable mentions here with the Winter Soldier killing Tony's parents. Oh, yeah, that was an interesting uh, reveal that, um, yeah, you know. It's a good way that, to tie in the whole uh, the whole war together, right? Like, you killed my parents. Why are you defending this guy? Uh, you're supposed to be Captain America. You're supposed to be, uh, you yeah. know, the Paragon. A paragon of truth and justice. No, that 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 I thought that was good. I wouldn't again, not not something that was like, oh my god, but like, oh, that's a great way to tie it in. That's a great way to get them against each other. Yeah. Uh, by the way, that movie, Captain America: Civil War, one of my one of my top three. Yes. Favorite. One of the best Marvel movies. Period. Just that initial uh, fight scene. Great. Oh yeah, amazing. The the airport stuff. Uh, yes. That whole yes, sequence. Yes. So great. Uh, the secrets out. Spider Man: Far From Home. This is when Peter's. Um, you know, basically J <laughs> outed. J Jonah. Yeah. Uh, great, great moment just because we got to see Jay Jonah. We got to see him up there on the screen yelling about Peter and, and, and outing him essentially. And then, you know, the leaving us on a cliffhanger like that, a home alone moment. But so, no one uh, expect no one expected that too, eh? No, no, I had no idea. So yeah, a speechless moment for sure. A great, crazy way to end a movie and keep the fans waiting for the next one. I would probably argue that that should be within the top 10. I would maybe pluck yeah. out another one of Spidey's moments because that was pretty, as far as speechless goes, we were, I remember yeah. being in the audience being like, what? Uh, yeah, like, what? what? Oh, Watch Mojo's got plenty of, of honorable mentions here. Uh, Star Fox from the Eternals. Oh, this is the Harry Styles uh, reveal, right? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. I think he's supposed to be, yeah, Thanos' brother. Uh, I had no idea yeah. who he was or who the character was, so yeah. I'm not shocked at all. Just more like Harry Styles in, in this movie. Who, who is he? What's he doing? I don't, I don't understand. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Thor Ragnarok. Hela breaks the hammer, smashes it. Yeah, that was cool. That was pretty that was cool. cool. 
I wouldn't say shocking, but pretty cool. Uh, and then the other honorable mention is the, oh, the return of uh, Matt Murdock as yeah. the lawyer. That's fun. fun. Moment. Those, fun those moment. are fun. Not, those really are fun not moments. Speechless. Speaking of Daredevil, he's and and Disney Plus. He's getting his own. Yes. Resurgence. Finally, he's yeah. He's he's such. I love you know. I love that Marvel keeps the characters that the fans love. Just like saying like J. Jonah Jameson, they wouldn't you know they wouldn't trade him out for anybody. Yeah. So I like that they're keeping. Um, What's his name? Matt. I think his name is. Um, Matt Murdock is his, his name. But anyway, I like that they're keeping the, the, the Charlie. Yeah, Charlie. Oh, Charlie. Something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Charlie. Oh, I, I love that they're keeping him. He's, he's a great, he's, he's a great, great, great uh, Daredevil. Uh, no need to go back to, uh, uh, what's his name? <laughs> the first Daredevil. We just oh, Ben Taylor Affleck. Again. Oh, Ben Affleck. Yeah. I Maybe mean... they'll do a cameo. Maybe we'll see Ben Affleck somewhere in there. Who knows? That would be funny. Who knows? Um, as long as they don't yeah. do another Electra with uh, Jennifer Garner. Yeah. No, I don't think that's happening. Think Terrible. So. Kingpin all the way. Kingpin all the way. <laughs> of course. Number one, it was it. Could it be anything else that left us speechless in the MCU? It had to be the snap, the original snap from uh, from Thanos. Man, I, you know, you kind of you knew it was coming. You knew could yes. they do it? Maybe they wouldn't do it. He did it, I and mean, then you saw everyone dust away, and you're like, oh, how, man, how, man. how, why? That, that Peter, that Peter scene when Peter's, you know, in oh. Tony's arms, saying that he doesn't want it. That was the <laughs> most heartbreaking moment yeah. out of all of the MCU for me. Just watching him fade away. Yeah, I mean, you can't get worse than killing off, you know, all these characters that we've fallen in love with, and and you know, you, you're so close. If Thor makes this amazing entrance. He's got that. He's got the axe. He he nails yeah. him, and he just didn't go for the head and. It's so it's it, it adds so much weight, and also watching Vision, you know, watching Vision's death mean nothing at that point because he uses the Time Stone as well. I mean, it's just it from that point on, it just becomes tragedy after tragedy. Um, definitely, definitely left everybody in the room speechless. Very deserving number one. Amazing. That was another moment where, uh, you know, watching in cinemas, everyone was kind of silent. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, it was yeah. it was an eerie feeling watching that on the big screen and and. Everyone just kind of being like, that happened. Wow. Yeah. That happened. Leaving the theater is supposed to be happy, but you're leaving like no, the, you're... <laughs> depressed. depressed. <laughs> it's like leaving a funeral. Yeah, exactly. Everyone's like, oh, like, incredible. Uh, speaking of incredible, it's always fun to have you on the show, Ricky, uh, To especially talking the superhero stuff. Come on. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's my favorite thing to do. I don't have, I don't talk to anybody else about it. So, you know, I get on here and uh, I get to, I get to shoot the, the good stuff. Amazing. All right, well, uh, it is now time for our Mojo Chats of the Week. We're starting with uh, the director and one of the stars of the new film, Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul. I see your Jaws thing in the background. I just saw it for the first time while I was at Martha's Vineyard a couple weeks ago. Or a couple days ago, like two days ago. You just saw Jaws for the first time? I know, it's, it's a whole, it's a whole thing. Our parents abided by the MPAA ratings. Yeah, we're 31. Oh. We're catching okay. up. Yeah, We're catching up. Well, I'll tell you what a lot of people are going to be watching, and that and that would be uh, your movie, Hawk for Jesus, Save Your Soul. The Evo twins are here to tell me all about it. Um, okay, let's start with... Uh, what this movie or the premise, I guess, these kind of mega churches that that world. What did what did that mean to you? Is this was this part of your upbringing? I don't know yeah. who wants to kick this one off. I mean, very much so, part of our upbringing. We're from Atlanta originally, and so church is everything. But also like the flex of mega churches, especially in the early two thousands, that was just part. That was the entire culture. Like, yeah. I don't think we knew anyone who did not go to church. Yeah. Uh, and most people went to mega churches. So yeah, that was actually, just part of part of us. Yeah, the church that, that we shot in actually yeah. is, is a church. It wasn't like our home church, but a church we grew up going to frequently. Yeah. And it's like 20 minutes from our parents' house. Yeah. Okay, and one of the things that people are kind of asking is, are these characters that we see in, in your film, are they based on anybody that you care to admit? <laughs> uh, they are based on an amalgamation of people. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. This kind of stuff keeps happening. These, yeah. po these folks keep popping up. Yeah. They're not based on any one individual, but they're, they're based on an amalgamation of people. Absolutely. Uh, okay, let's talk about the actors that you've got to play these characters. Oh my God. Uh, Sterling K. Brown, amazing. Regina, uh, Regina, I, I will watch, read a phone book. Uh, any, anything she does. <laughs> Us too. <laughs> so great. Uh, so what led you to to, the, to that casting, and were, and were those really your your two choices? 
Regina was all, it's funny, when we first met with Daniel Kaluuya, she, he was like, who, who do you have in mind? And this is like early on, yeah. like I was still an assistant. And he was like, who do you envision being the first lady character? And I was like, a Regina Hall type? Because I was like, I can't get Regina Hall in my first feature, that's ridiculous. Right. Um, but you know, one of Daniel's partners knew her agent and he was, she was like, we can, we can slip her in the script and yeah. see what she thinks. And she dug it. She said yes in the room when we met. Yeah, it, it was very much about finding someone who, could, who had the tonal breadth of both comedy and drama. For because sure. Ours is like a tonal mix, uh, and we needed someone who could definitely bring the hard funny, but also like the kind of tragic dramatic that it ends up. Yeah, we knew into. we knew Regina could do yeah. both, and Sterling and took us a little longer. Sterling huh? took us longer because we well, finding Lee Curtis took us a little longer yeah. because we everyone no one was feeling quite right, and I can't remember who brought up Sterling, but our first question was like, wait, is he funny? Because we were like, we're used to him making us cry from like sadness. Um, <laughs> but not from like laughter and then we were like scrolling down his imdb page and we saw that he was nominated for an emmy for an episode of brooklyn 99 and we we're like okay let's turn this on and we watched it and we he is so he's so good he's in like it. deadpan funny in it and he also plays a narcissist which was really helpful for yeah, us like a murderous dentist yeah he's a murderous dentist in it um and so we were just like okay that's it like he's he's lee curtis yeah that. and then we got the two of them in the room and the chemistry was instant yeah Amazing. Well, everybody brings it. Uh, it's, it's such a wonderful film, and we do want to steer people towards it. And also, the wardrobe. We'll give a give a nice shout out to all those amazing uh, wardrobes. And, yeah, uh, and the looks are great. The costumes, so great. Uh, thank you, uh, ladies, so so much. Thank you. Hawk for Jesus, save your soul. That is the uh, the name of the movie uh, from the Ebo twins and. <laughs> Guys, this is a really great ride. I want to call it a comedy a satire with also its fair share of drama. But who better to tell me about it than one of the stars? Hey, Nicole, how are you? Hey, thank you for having me. That was a great intro. I think I think you did it. I did it. I, I did OK. Well maybe, is, is. well, maybe tease us a little bit more about what people can expect out of this film, because we are playing with different tones, which is kind of fun. And also yeah. tell us who, uh, who we can expect out of your particular character playing with different tones kind of asking some questions and in a little bit of a documentary mockumentary style which you said like with little aspects of drama um taking a little look at the mega church industrial complex <laughs> is that what I should call it on like mega churches uh we have two sort of mega churches that are um vying for the intention of the community and we're seeing what that looks like, what the ambition, what the intentions are of the people who run the church and also of the people that are involved in the community. I don't wanna give away too much, you know, about what sort of happens, but I play um, Shakura Sumter, who is a neighboring rival church, if churches can be rival churches, who is sort of opening after the larger uh, church wander to greater past, has had some issues and maybe some of their congregation has decided to trickle over to our side. Nicole, what's your relationship with these mega churches? Like, have you been, I've never been, so am I, are what we seeing in the film, obviously that we're being satirical here, is this what kind of what it's like? Well, you know, okay, I can't speak for every church, right? Every region of the United States and maybe even other countries, it's all very different. But I have gone to a few large churches in the South um, growing up and have a little bit of experience with that. But I don't know necessarily if this is the behind the scenes. I think we're also taking a bit of liberty because it's a comedy, you know, et cetera. But yeah, there are parts of it that feel like they could be true. Absolutely. Uh, okay, let's talk about some of the people that are in the film uh, alongside you. I mean, <laughs> Regina, I could, she- Regina she, Hall, she can't do any wrong. She does. I say she could read a phone book and I would just, I would pay, I would actually pay to see that. Uh, Sterling K. Brown, do you have a, a fun uh, moment or a favorite moment on set uh, working with these fine folks? Yeah, we have a scene where it's, it's, it's the four of us and we're sort of negotiating who's going to have the very powerful opening date that we all want to have this like special opening date. And we went off script. The things that Sterling K. Brown came up with that didn't that you guys will never see unfortunately i'm sorry <laughs> but you'll see a really brilliant performance but the things that they came up with i mean they are they are like a really interesting couple together but yeah comedically i i actually didn't know that he could do all of that i didn't know that he had right 
you know, because he has a really great, like strong gravity bearing. We see him in This Is Us, but this is completely different and really interesting. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, last thing I want to touch on is that was really kind of cool in this movie was seeing all the different outfits. Am I right about this? The clothes were. Yeah, yeah. clothes are a big part of it. Yeah. I mean, your your presentation, um, it's aspirational for people who are going to church or people in communities who are looking for hope, right? So I think the way that we dress our church versus the way that the other church dresses, it speaks volumes to like the, the community, but also to the intentions of the people who are running, <laughs> running the church, you know? I, I know, yeah, yeah, that's as far as I'm gonna take. <laughs> Absolutely, no, I think you nailed it. I think everyone else involved uh, really captured uh, what they're going for really great. We wanna steer people towards it. Uh, it's really great stuff. Thank you so much for your time today, Nicole. Thank you. Really appreciate it. All right, now here's my chat with Tom Hopper and Kat Graham, who star in Netflix's rom-com, Love in the Villa. Listen, people love their rom-coms. Kat, why are people going to love Love in the Villa? Oh my gosh, there's so many reasons to love this movie. <laughs> As a fan of the movie, forget that I'm even in it, right? Just forget it. But like the, 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 the location, you got Tom Hopper, you've got the fashion, you've got, did I mention the food? It's just the storyline. There's so many of us who have gone through loss and heartbreak, especially over the past two years. And we want to feel like there's hope. And there's a way forward and it's done in such a fun and beautiful way. It's going to bring so much happiness and laughter and silly. I would be a fan of this movie, even if I wasn't in it for sure. I think that's why people like that rom-com genre. It does bring that hope and, and, and it, you know, it puts a smile on your face and you get to have a good time and you get to kind of put yourself in those situations. Tom, why did you want to uh, jump in on this particular project? Well, you know, I, I'm always, whenever I'm looking at my next project, I'm always looking for a new challenge, something that I would feel tested on and feel something that I'd never done before. Um, and this was certainly that for me. You know, my wife, who plays Cassie in the movie, she read it first. And she was like, I really think you should read this movie. I think it's something that you would, uh, you would like, and I think it'd be good for you. And uh, so I did. And I, I was a little bit apprehensive, you know, when I... Uh, would start reading it but I just fell in love with the movie and finished it and was like oh man I think I really want to make this movie <laughs> yeah. so when I made uh when I met Mark um Mark Stephen Johnson is just an absolute gem of a filmmaker and so as soon as I met him I was I was fully on board so there's just something so beautiful about a movie like this that I think we really need at the moment you know I think more movies like this the better Absolutely. Now, people probably recognize you, Tom, uh, another Netflix show, The Umbrella Academy. You play Luther. Uh, scale of one to ten, how much is your character in this movie like Luther oh, at all? Probably one or two. <laughs> one or two. Yeah, he's very different. <laughs> very uh, different. Yeah. Uh, that's the beauty. That's the beauty of being an actor. You get to do these different yeah. parts. Uh, Kat, let's swing back to you. You did mention the location uh what's your relationship with verona had had you been there prior to making this movie yeah to break up and then we got back together in verona i have a very deep deep relationship with that that city it's very bizarre so yeah i know it really well <laughs> interesting uh okay tom <laughs> yeah <Go> come on <laughs> Well, no, I mean, that's fascinating stuff. And, and it's a beautiful location. That's one of it's like a, it's like the extra character in the movie, which I really loved. But let's yeah. say I or other people watching go to Verona, go on the vacation. What's the one? What's that one spot we should visit? Maybe it's featured in your film. Go to the yard and eat food <laughs> in the yard. <laughs> or or walk down the street that Juliet's balcony is on. Which mm. food is great, but you're going to Verona for the romance. You're going to buy a locket, and then you're going to write the initials of you and your significant other, and then you're going to put it on the wall. Yes, the food, but but do the romantic stuff. It's really cute. Okay, yeah, I'm going to very cute. Well, maybe call my the... travel agent now. Book it. Do it. Yeah, you should buy buy a padlock before you go. You'll save some cash. 
<laughs> there you go. Well, listen, the movie is titled uh, Love in the Villa. And as you just heard, there's going to be lots to love about it. Uh, definitely do check it out over there on Netflix. Thank you guys so much for your time. Thanks, man. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this edition, everybody. Big thanks going out to all my guests. Such great movies out there. Make sure you check them all out. And hey, Ricky Tucci, my man, Watch Mojo's very own. Always love having him on the program. And hey, big thanks going out to you for watching and listening. Till next time, I've been Mr. Hollywood. Pop in the culture.